So uh, Proverbs 30 continues similarly to the rest of the book. Uh, but this one, we'll see at the beginning there, it says the words of Augur, son of Jaka. Uh, and we don't know who that is. Just to <laughs> cut off any potential questions about who that is. We don't know. Um, so here's what the Lutheran Study Bible note says. We do not know who Augur, son of Jaka, was, nor do we know when he spoke these words or when they were recorded. The words of Augur featured numerical sayings. Seven sayings. These sayings involve a list of examples that stand together to illustrate the truth. The sayings often appear in a formula stating a number for the list and then adding one. The sayings also have the feel of a riddle, inviting the listener to guess what the uniting point of the list is or what items may appear in the list. So, for example, if you look at 18 and 19, three things are too wonderful for me, or I do not understand. The way of the eagle in the sky, the way of the serpent on a rock, the way of a ship on the high seas. And the way of a man with a virgin, right? So it says three, then he names four. Um, so upon three things, the earth trembles, under four, it cannot bear up. Uh, four things on the earth are small, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer, the rock badgers. <clears throat> so just a side note there. You're supposed to, in the seminary every year, we have intramurals, and they give you a different theme for how to name the teams. And one was animals and scriptures. And we did have a rock badger. So here you go. The rock badgers are a people not mighty. That they make their homes in the cliffs. The locusts have no king. Yet all of them march and rank. The lizard you can take in your hands. Yet it is in king's palaces. So kind of a strange chapter here. Um, but the, uh, the focus here is that... Uh, wait a minute. Um, having demonstrated to his audience their inability to attain their true wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, Augur points them to the source and purveyor of all these things. God's word is the only tried, tested, and proven shelter from the false wisdom that leads ultimately to damnation. So he's, again, pointing to um, God. So there were some themes like we encountered in Job, uh, right, that, that only God is in control of all these things, and so there's all these other elements that kind of fall away and pass away. Um, and then uh, chapter 31, the words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. And just so you know, an oracle is a prophetic message. Um, and again here, uh, we don't, uh, let me see here. King Lemuel means dedicated to God. Some biblical scholars suggest that it may be a pseudonym for King Hezekiah or possibly King Josiah. Um, so, we're not 100% sure who King Lemuel is either, um, an oracle that his mother taught him. So then, then you get a little slightly different perspective here from the mother <coughs> speaking to her son. Um, and then, of course, it ends with this acrostic poem, this acrostic Hebrew poem about the woman who fears the Lord. Um, so my one question was, uh, what sort of jumped out at you in these two chapters? Is there one element that jumped out at you or uh, some part of that poem that jumped out at me. Stay away from fast women and liquor. Stay away from fast women and liquor, yeah. <laughs> right. I, I thought the thing that was interesting to me is uh, we often, when we hear something about men or women, we think about it just purely in reaction to like our own self. So I, I like the context here of a parent talking to their child. Right, so they're not they're not making statements about things that they wish were true, but they want the good for their child, and so like it gives quite a different picture of the woman who fears the Lord as far as the woman to be desired than what you might think if you're just talking about what you want, right? Um, so it kind of bypasses some of that back and forth. Yeah. Mine, mine was the way of the, of the ship on the high seas. Um, I spent eight years, and I still don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. What verse is that? Um, so, um, Proverbs 19, the way of an able, the way of a ship on the high seas. He says it's too amazing. Back to 30, 19. Oh, 30, 30, 30. 30. Oh, way of a ship on the high seas, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, so the summary of Proverbs would be. If you would, if you would like to summarize it, how might you summarize Proverbs as we journey through that book? Fear the Lord because He's God and you're not. 
Yeah. You're the Lord because he's God and you're not, right? And he's he's the source of what what do people go to Proverbs to get? Wisdom. Wisdom. Who is the source of wisdom? God. Right. And that fear of the Lord sort of orients that whole that whole approach, right? Um, is that he's the source of that. Any last questions about Proverbs? All right. So we have a uh, I'm gonna continue with these. I think in the future though, I'm gonna curtail. The discussions a bit more uh, just so they don't take up the whole class since this is an advertised as a class for these different books in the bible um, but fear not in the fall christian education plans to get back to at least either rotating or having the option of having a book of the bible bible class because i can tell there are a fair number of you who really like that that's why it takes us forever to get through the little biblical literacy reading section so um, but we're going to continue to do that here because it's important to be in our Bibles. So, what should our next book be? What? Jude. Jude. Oh. Hey, What's the last time you guys read Jude? It's been a while for me, too. What do you think? Jude? Right before Revelation? All right, let's do it. So, let's look here. I don't even know how many chapters Jude has on the does one? Oh, all right. There we go. All right. So we'll read the book of Jude. The whole book is a sign for next Sunday. Um, so don't drown in all the words. Okay? Um, so we'll we'll read through that for next Sunday, and we'll do a little a little study. Maybe a question or two. All right. Okay. Now, if you've got your catechism, open up your catechism. We're going to talk about baptism. Uh, if you don't, make sure you grab a handout. So one of the handouts up here on the front table. Uh, you can need one. And we're on the blessings of the baptism section. All right. So we've, we've covered a fair, we've covered like the intro to baptism. So I'd like to do a little, a little quiz here. Um, somebody in their own words explain, or let's just as a group explain what's happening at baptism and why we do it. So uh, if you were trying to explain to somebody that, hey, I've never heard of baptism, what is that? Why do you do it? What's going on? Um, what might you say? It's um, a sacramental act of obedience which has a outward significance and an inward significance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a sacramental act which is an act of obedience that has, um, say that, say the uh, both an external meaning in which a person is literally washed with water and then an internal or spiritual significance. In which a person, their rebirth or regeneration of Christ is both symbolized and manifested. Okay. So, um, yes. Instead of, <coughs> so we clarified a few things there. One is that it's an act of obedience. Let's, let's unpack that for a second. What does it mean that baptism is an act of obedience? God commands it. Yeah, right? Jesus says in Matthew 28, baptize. Uh, so, you should probably do that, right? Uh, I was just listening to something the other day, and the person mentioned that, you know, the, the last words of Mary, mother of Jesus, the Gospels, is do whatever he tells you at the wedding at Canaan, right? So, Whenever he's going to change, when she said she she doesn't know that he has the magic power to change water and wine. She just says he's going to fix the problem, and he says, "Woman, it's not my time." And then she, seemingly ignoring Jesus, says, "Do whatever he tells you. Listen to your and mother." Right? <laughs> um, and so, as Christians, that's pretty good advice for us to do whatever he tells you. Right? Yeah. yeah. Tangible and intangible elements: water and the word. Okay. So we have we have the elements at play here. We have the, the tangible element of water. 
Why would we say the word is intangible? What's actually happening when I speak words? Is it a spiritual thing or a physical thing? Spiritual. Spiritual? You speak words. It's physical. Sound waves are coming out of my mouth and going into your ear. Not just any words, but this again is consistent with God's approach to using things and matter that He created. Right. So often, I think we we think of in the sacraments we have the visible element of the water, but the word is also a visible, in a sense, a tangible element. Right. Um, because if you cover your ears. Are you receiving it? No, no right? Um, so the so the gospel is is this tactile thing, right? And it's been it's being made even more tactile in the sacraments. So you have you have water and the word, right? And that's sort of one of the questions in the catechism, right? How can water do such great things? Well, surely not just water, but water combined with God's word. Very good. Um, I still think we haven't fully unpacked why it's an act of obedience. Forgiveness of the original sin. There is that. We'll get to that. There's one. So we got Jesus commands it, right? And what's our role in baptism? We do play a role. Witness. No, not in your own baptism. You're bringing the child. So we're talking about the person being baptized. <laughs> Oh, the person being there. Yeah. Yeah. What, what verb did you use there? Receive. Receive. Receive, right? Our role is a passive role. And when you're obeying, when you do obedience, there's passive obedience and active obedience. Right? Um, so if your parent tells you to go clean your room, is that active obedience or passive? Yeah. It's active, right? Because you got to go and do something. Right. Um, if the command from the person in charge is be baptized, is that active or passive? No. Because the verb there then is a passive verb because the work is being done to you, right? You're not doing the work, right? So it's, it's an act of obedience because Jesus commands it and because he does the whole Right. So when somebody says, who baptized you, what should your answer be? Jesus. It should be Jesus. Right? Now, I might be standing up there, and I'm the one saying the words, and it might be my hand, but I'm only doing all of that in the stead and by the command of who? Jesus. Right? And so who's actually doing the baptizing? Jesus. Right? Okay, so it's an act of obedience. And it's a work God is doing, and our role is to receive it. Okay, that's why when the pastor is saying the words, there's no expectation of you to say the words with him, right? Because it's Jesus speaking to you, and you receive it. Right? It's Jesus doing something to you, and you receive it. Okay, well, so can, can yeah. anybody say those words? Can Tell anybody say those words? Yeah. So Open your catechism <coughs> to the very last page. Somebody who's got a catechism here, open the very last page, right on the inside of the back cover. What does it say? Used in emergencies. A short form of baptism to be used in emergencies. That is actually in the very beginning, I believe, of the TLH. Yes. Right. And why is it at the back or at the beginning? It's easy to find because if you're using that, you don't have time to go look through a book, right? You got to find it right away. Okay. So the answer to your question is technically anyone can. But the probably the better question is should. Well, what's, I mean, what's the purpose of baptism? Is it an emergency? Oh, that's a great question. What's an emergency? Well, an emergency would be where. The child cannot be brought to baptism by the normal means before they die. That's an emergency. So an emergency would be if a baby is born and they're not sure it's going to live very long. Right? And 
there may not be time for the pastor to drive for 30 minutes to get to the hospital and get there. Right? So, um, so what's normative versus what's permissible in emergencies? Correct. Right. right. So um, should, should you then, because we are able to do this in, in emergencies, uh, because again, who's doing the baptizing? Jesus is, right? Um, should that then follow that we should do that? We should then use that as a, a means by saying, well, anybody can baptize. So I'm a dad, I got kids at home. I'm just going to baptize my kids at home because that's what I think the early church did. I'm not just asking you, that's. Desired, not desired, but not precluded. Are you, I, I, are I, you I, like a, in the legal field? Or something? I, 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 <laughs> there's a lot of Paul that talks about, um, you know, order and sobriety and predictability. So, I mean, we don't go to little house churches anymore that, you know, it's just me and my two neighbors. Right. Um, well, and also think about what when when Christ is instituting the church, he's instituting something that he wishes to speak and do things on his behalf for the rest of time until he returns. <laughs> so if you're making, let's say, like you would like your grandchildren 10 generations from now to know something, and that's something you want them to know is specific, what might go into your plan for passing that on? Might write it down because what might happen after 10 generations if you don't write it down? Forget. It could be a totally different thing, or one person might forget. And then if that one person forgets, the chain is totally broken, right? <laughs> so God has given the church through Jesus, instituting the church, orders and ways of doing things so as to preserve his word and the gifts that he's given the church. Right? Now, just like most gifts he's given to the church. They're not meant to enslave us, which in the case of an emergency, that rule would be an enslavement. Right? It would sort of violate its own purpose. So an emergency would be where you know you would give opportunity essentially for the devil to use the good against the good. Right? Well, we got to do this for, for good order. Well, but it's really for the salvation of souls. And so we're not going to prevent that from happening for the sake of good order. But for the sake of good order is a good argument and somebody just wants to do it because they want to do it and they don't want to pastor. And I've met a few people that are that way and there's usually other spiritual things going on that give them the desire to do it. Yeah. But <clears throat> what about... What's the what, question behind your question? <laughs> <laughs> the question is um, if you had a grandchild and you know you, that grandchild would never be baptized if it was left up. Yeah. Uh -huh. is, is that is that an okay time to do this emergency baptism? Um, so the short answer is no. Um, but that doesn't leave you without without recourse. So one is uh, prayer. So you should be lifting that person up in prayer constantly. You mean right? the parents? No, the child. The child that you want to be baptized. Um, you should be lifting up the very thing that you're asking about should be a prayer that they come to baptism, whether it's through their parents or whether their parents agree to let you do that. Right? So you can get the consent of the parents, but there's two aspects to baptism. Baptism is, there's the one and done part, which is you don't come here every week and I don't dunk you every week. Right? But what do you do every week that's tied to baptism by Jesus in Matthew 28? He doesn't just say baptize people and then you're done. What does he say? No, make disciples. Disciples. There's two parts to making disciples, right? Making disciples by baptizing them and then doing what? Teaching, right? So baptism and teaching are a package deal, right? And we do. And when you go through the baptismal rite and you talk to the sponsors, that's one of the things that you ask them: is that Are you committing to bear witness to their baptism and teach them according to what they're being baptized into, right? So if you are as a grandparent wanting to baptize a grandchild when your children don't don't want to or they won't they won't do it themselves you can, can like if you came to me and you said 
and, and I and they would speak to me and they have to tell me that they're okay with you doing that. And then you're committing to take spiritual responsibility for the grandchild that they are taught the ways of God and, and that, that the parents are okay with you doing that, then I, I would do it. But it's not really the place of the grandparent to this is that's not an emergency. Um, it's difficult, but there's also the time uh, when the grandchild is old enough to speak for themselves, and that's why you pray and seek every opportunity to. to I mean, essentially, you would basically treat them like an unbeliever in the sense that you can witness to them about Christ as often as you can, and as often as the parents allow. Uh, but you can't steal the kid away and baptize them in secret. Um, so, but basically the church doesn't ever want to do one of these practices in a way that will cause doubt. So if I change elements of how it's done, that's why we don't say like creator, nurturer, and redeemer. We say father, son, and spirit, right? Um, that's why it's water. It's not Coca-Cola. Um, you mean like to say you messed up the words for thousands of baptisms, therefore none of them are baptized? Well, no, we don't say that, but, but I would say I would say that's a good reason why you should pay very close attention to the words, because if it causes any of those people to then doubt their the validity of their baptism, that's not a good thing, right? No. Now, I would say we wouldn't go back and say, well, so, you know, screw the pooch, so they're all invalid, because again, who's doing the baptized? Jesus. Jesus. That's the, that's the but, but there is, like, that then doesn't follow that we shouldn't pay attention to the good order. Um, so does that sort of answer your question? Okay. If we're talking about something, sounds like we're talking about something specific. Yeah. So if you'd like to chat with me about that after. Okay. <laughs> you never know. I mean, essentially, essentially what I told you is never give up. The reason you're praying for them is not because you think it's going to necessarily do any good, but because you're talking to one person who can do literally anything. About it. So, um, so don't give up. Okay. Yeah. Is there any reason if you were baptized as a child and then you fall away from the church and now you're coming back? Is there any reason to be baptized? Um, so the question was if you were baptized as a child and you went away from the church and came back, is there any reason to be baptized? The short answer to that is no, because uh, when we confess the creeds, we say uh, one baptism for the remission of sins, right? Uh, and that's to refute the heresy of multiple baptisms. That we can talk a little bit about like where that comes from. Um, but if so, this is another reason for the good the good order, kind of going back to your question of like, can we just do this? Um, is if you baptize a baby in secret, there are no witnesses, there are no formal documents. And so let's say that baby grows up and you're dead, and they don't know if they're baptized because there's no witnesses. You told them, but that's just the word of one person, right? So that's why when you get baptized in a church, what happens? It's a public thing, so there are always witnesses, and you get a certificate. And churches are, are supposed to keep all of those records. Those are called official acts of the church. So that 50 years down the road, if somebody's coming back and they said, I, somebody told me I was baptized here, but I don't know. I said, well, let's look. I can go back in the record and say, yeah, you're baptized, you know, 2022, March 31st. It has a convenience, but that's also not law. Like in the first century AD, I'm sure they weren't keeping church records. We're not, we're not talking about law. We're talking about what's the good practice yeah. and why we do it. Right? So I can't, I can't uh, hand down a law that says under no circumstances can you baptize anyone because you're not a pastor. But I can tell you that it's probably not a great practice, um, and I can give you a bunch of reasons why. And so the, the argument for the history of the church and the tradition of the church is pretty strong in this case, um, because a lot of uh, Americans, we have a, a pretty high disdain for the argument of tradition, which I think is a mistake. Right? Um, if the church has been doing something for two millennia, that means it's survived empires and nations generation after generation after generation that shouldn't be scoffed at because you think you know better right? 
that's actually a far more dangerous thing to do is to go down a path of thinking, well, I figured out the reason why the church is declining is because we've been doing this and people are tired of that, so we should do this now instead. Because essentially what you're saying when you do that is, I know better than two millennia of Christians and the guiding of the Holy Spirit of the church. Right? Um, so it's not to say that none of those things can be changed, but you should think very long and hard about, one, why you want to change that and why did this stick around for so long? Because the United States isn't even anywhere near that old old country. So, so that, that would be my, my argument for good order and the history of the church. Um, and there's a reason that God sort of, through, there's a reason Jesus instituted that in sort of an organizational sense. And so that this is this is carried on. Um, now we can get over the complicated the way we do things. So if you didn't get a baptismal certificate, does that mean your baptism is invalid? No. But does that mean then that we shouldn't do the baptismal certificate? Also no. Right? So we have this habit in the United States of saying, well, there's this except exception. So because there's this exception, we should get rid of the norm, which is a horrible idea. It's totally dumb. Like but maybe you were born with one leg. Well, people are, you can no longer say that men are, a man is a two-legged preacher. You can still say man is a two-legged preacher because somebody's born with one leg. So, um, do I? Identify as a two-legged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rob, you have your It's also important to note that uh, if one is not baptized, but they believe in Christ, they're saved. I just said like the thief on the cross. Sure. It's important to note, and then you should immediately want to baptize that person if you're given the chance to, right? So, again, that's another one where uh, it's good to point out, certainly good to point out, it's bad to use that as, a, as an excuse to not get baptized. Um, why? Well, because, as Russ pointed out, it's an act of obedience because Jesus said to do it, right? So you should just do what he tells you. Listen to Mary and then it's just do whatever he tells you to do, right? Um, Okay, so Baptist an act of obedience is done in, in the order and tradition of the church, um, which is not an invaluable, an inviolable law, but it is a really good practice and it's been honed over millennia, right? Um, so there's a reason all those things are done. Um, and in the case of emergency, anyone can do it because who's really doing the baptism? Jesus, right? Um, because can anybody stand up there and say the words of institution? Can you can you read those words, Michael, from the bulletin? Can you just read them out loud in front of a group of people? Are you capable of that? Yeah, yeah. right. So why is it that I don't ask a different person to come up every Sunday to the altar and read the words of institution? The Latin expression "norms normans." Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've, we've called you to do this stuff, do this stuff. Right, right. So, um, and I think, it, especially in the realm of church, we have a unique sort of derision for that idea. Um, but think about it in other ways. So, uh, there are tons of things that purely because of your calling, your vocation, are good for you to do and not good for other people to do. So, for example, if you're a doctor or a nurse, it's good that you administer a shot to me. If you're some random dude that lives in my neighborhood, it's not good, right? Um, if you're a mom or a dad, it's good that you discipline your children. Is it good for random strangers to discipline your children? No, right? Not unless you have expressly given them permission to do so, right? So our, this is basically how human life works, right? God calls us to vocations, and within those vocations, we have appropriate authority we have given authority from God to do certain things, right? And in the church, we would say that the office of the, the holy ministry, the person that, which holds that office is called a pastor, that God has given particular authorities to for that person to carry out. Okay? And it's important that they remain with the office and not with the person, because what happens if that person abuses those authorities given to them? Is the office destroyed? No. What happens then? What? No, it's not valid anymore, right? They get you get what's the old term was defrocked. You get removed, right? 
Because what you're doing is you're tarnishing the vocational authority of the office of the ministry by not obeying it. Right? And so if you do that, to the extent where it makes it basically impossible for you to hold that office, you are kicked out of it. Um, and then if I'm kicked out of it, can I still give communion and preach openly publicly in a church? No. Because it's no longer given to me to do so. Right? And I also would no longer have a, I wouldn't be in some middle ground between Maggie and the pastor as far as whether or not I baptize randomly. I would now be a lay person like Maggie and only in the case of emergency should I. So, so this is sort of the, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but that's kind of the, the way the order of the church and the traditions um, are helpful and good. And, and the reason I, I kind of harp on that a bit is because in my lifetime in the United States, we'll find the exception to those traditions and say, well, see, those traditions are worthless because they're not, they're not like absolute, and so we should do something else, okay. uh, which... Do that at your own risk. Okay. Um, there's typically a reason something's been around for a really, really long time. Um, okay. All righty. So baptism is an act of obedience. God's doing work, so you're just passively receiving it. I don't know why I closed my text. Um, and so what is our job in baptism is to receive. So we don't speak, we don't do anything, we simply receive the words of water, right? And now today we're going to talk about the blessings of baptism. What does it do, right? So we've talked about what baptism is, what its nature is. It's the visible elements of the water combined with God's word, that touch. And what is happening in baptism? What is the blessing of baptism is what we're talking about. So let's read together that first box at the top of your handout. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe in this, as the words and promises of God declare. Okay, so I think this was what Russ was getting at when he was saying it's not just a symbol. Something actually happens to you in baptism. What is it? Forgiveness of sins. Very good. Receive the Holy Spirit. Deliverance from death and the devil. Right? So you get life, salvation, forgiveness of sins. All brought to you by the Holy Spirit, right? Through your baptism. Right? And we, we know this because it's promised to us in the scripture. Right. So, can you think of a good reason why you shouldn't do it? Right. So, if if somebody says, "Well, yeah, but it says in the Bible that you can be you can believe and, and still be saved without being baptized," so you want to get baptized? You should get baptized. Why not? Oh, okay. Well, let's get baptized. Right. There's really no like if you just ask the question. There's really no good response if somebody's genuinely weak. Right? Um, now, if they continue to resist, you can't say for sure they're not a genuine believer, but it sounds like there's some spiritual issues that need to unpack there. Right? Um, probably related to the fact that it's an act of obedience. Okay, second question. Which are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay. So there's your scriptural connection there. And again, emphasizing that uh, belief is the thing that prevents condemnation right there. Right. Um, but get baptized. Okay. Baptism bestows the forgiveness of sins. Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're actually going to read a little bit of this here. We're going to read verses 1 to 14. A little bit of the section after that. Okay. 
When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rush of wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And as they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And as they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jew, <coughs> Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to wonder, what does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Then we're going to skip up to verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received him from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out on the, out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel before, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God, our God, calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So what were the, the two elements there? Huh? Water and blood. Water and what specifically? No, the Holy Spirit is not one of the elements. Word, right? Peter just gave a big sermon. And then their response after they were cut to the heart by the sermon was, what should I do? And what does Peter say? Repent and be baptized. Everyone, right? And then at the end it says they were. Um, so baptism has been a part of bringing people to faith, a part of that process since Pentecost, the beginning of the church. Okay. So this isn't some new practice that we've come up with. It's been there since the beginning. All right. So baptism, it also says there bestows the Holy Spirit. Um, notice here there's not two baptisms, but one, a single baptism of water and the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, so why does uh, Luther point that out? Why do we point that out that there's not two baptisms? Yeah. Is he anticipated Pentecostals? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Right? They, there, but there was also beginning at the time of Luther, there was a movement called the Anabaptist movement, which was rebelling against this idea of one baptism, right? Because there was a bunch of people who were like, well, if this person's baptized, but they don't behave like they're baptized. And so it must not have taken. Right? So we need to rebaptize you because you need to recommit. Right. What's the problem with that approach? What's the big What's the big change about baptism? The, the, the power then is transferred to the hands of man. That man is doing something, exactly. or it's kind of making Jesus' power seem uh, impotent. It It is turning baptism into what? Work. A work. A work that we do. Right. 
Oh, I'm committing to God. Oh, my faith needs to be strong enough so that I commit myself to him. And then what happens when um, Karen asked this question earlier, what happens if you baptize them when they're little and then they stray from the faith? Well, it must not have taken. So when they come back to the church, we have, well, you got to get baptized. Look at the stuff you did. Right? Well, so that makes perfect sense if you think baptism is a work that men do. Well, and, and also, um, I know my, my older daughter had some experience at going to um, and if you didn't speak in tongues, you were rather a second class in So, so, that, that is so what there, there had to be the tongue, the, the, there were two baptisms, the, the, the water one and then the spirit one, and if you didn't get the spirit one, evidence by speaking in tongues you were less something lesser right so um and that's what this this anabaptist movement mentioned leads to because if you start talking about believers baptism and you turn it into work that you do then you have to come up with some sort of explanation as to why um the the, the one sort of like ritual baptism didn't really take and you're either going to have to say well god his power is impotent here and this person is able to do whatever they want, you know. Um, or you can say, well, this is just one baptism, and this one is just a physical baptism, but we also need like spiritual proof that you're really a saved person, right? I think with, when, it, when it comes <clears throat> to adults agreeing to be baptized, I think one of the, the resistances I can imagine is that they don't feel like they know enough yet or are good enough yet or studied enough yet. Like as a yeah. new Christian, you think I'm at the foothill of this mountain, the learning I need to do, the discipleship right. I need to do. I don't think I should get baptized till I'm up here because I'm down here right now. And, they and what need, can what can we do? They need to be convinced that it's it, you know, it's it's the baby food. Yeah. It's not so how do we convince them? Bring them to the word to persuade them otherwise. Okay. Word. Yeah, use the word, right? So where would we go in the word if we're going to talk about baptism? We've already been there a little bit. So we go to Matthew 28, right? And where the church's job is to make disciples. Uh, and then what comes first and what comes second? Baptism comes first. It comes before the teaching of the word, right? So it stands to reason then that baptism is not dependent on the teaching and the learning. It's the gateway into all that stuff. And the reason that we believe that, not only because Jesus said it that way, but also because we believe baptism is actually doing something to you. You're not doing something to baptism. Right? So again, you can make you'll you'll start to understand why all of these other practices are happening in these churches if you switch the under the core understanding of baptism from a work of God to a work of man. And then all that stuff makes sense. Well, I don't know if my eight-year-old can commit themselves to Christ. I don't either. But it's a good thing we don't have to worry about that. But it's actually about Christ committing to you. Um, and so whether you're 75 or three months old, you're actually receiving it like a child regardless. Trusting in God. And he's doing, doing the work to you. Yeah. You just think about the apostles themselves. Without the blessing of the Holy Spirit, they were just confined to sitting in a room Figure out what happened. Right. So exactly. Get the spirit. They're out there spreading the word. Yeah. We can't even digest the word fully until we receive the spirit. Right? Exactly. Right. They had no idea what Jesus was doing all the way up until he was dead. Right. You know, the disciples in Emmaus on the road to Emmaus, and they think everything's done. Right. And then what does Jesus do when he shows up as a random guy they don't recognize? Does he just walk alongside them awkwardly? What does he do? He teaches. He opens the scriptures up to them, right? He reveals the truth of what's going on. And they don't recognize it until when? He breaks the bread, right? And then they recognize, right? The road to Emmaus is kind of a cool little, basically like a synopsis of our worship service. Right? Jesus comes to you. Don't really recognize him. He teaches you with his word, right? Service of the word, readings, preaching. And then even then you may still not recognize him. And then you go to the table, break the bread, and all of a sudden, oh, Jesus. Right? Um, yeah, so without his guidance, without his reaching out, without the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
The disciples are afraid and locked away in a room. Peter is certainly not preaching to 3,000 people. He's denying that he even knows Jesus to a bunch of randoms in, in a courtyard. Right? Uh, so all of these things point to that baptism is not a work that we do, but one that's done to us by God. Right? All right. Um, baptism bestows salvation. See 1 Peter 3.21. So hold that up for us. 1 Peter 3.21. Uh, Dave, can you look that one up? And then Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Janine, you get that? Um, note that man is passive in baptism and God is active. In other words, God is at work in holy baptism and giving a gift. So, how many people do you need to give a gift? Two. And what does one person do? One gives it. One gives, and what does the other person do? Receives, right? So I go back again. That's why I no longer have you guys say the blessing with me the end of service because god is wanting to give you his name as a gift like he did to the people in old testament israel <laughs> and our role in that is not the giver but the receiver and so we are meant to receive that word not speak it alongside god right um okay first peter 321 Continue. baptism which corresponds to this now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, right? And so and we know from, um, from other places with Paul that when we are baptized, we're baptized into the death and resurrection of Jesus. So what's that, one of the things that's happening in baptism is a sort of exorcism. Actually, is the old Adam is being kicked out and killed, right? being drowned. That's the way Jesus says. The old Adam being daily drown is, is the, the baptismal life. Um, and then what happens? A new spirit is brought up in you. You're made into a new thing. Right? Because we, we know that once the, once the bad spirit is out, you're not supposed to leave it empty, because then all you did was tidy up the space and it's going to come back to some of his friends. right? And so what does God do? He puts the new spirit, the Holy Spirit, God's spirit in you. Okay, Galatians you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All right. So baptism is like putting on Jesus. Okay. Uh, baptism is not an external symbol of an internal reality. It's not an external symbol of internal reality, but the very means by which God gives us new life. So if somebody asks you, what's the best day of your life, what should your response be? The day I was baptized, because the old me died and the new me was born. Right? I've also thought that it would be really powerful and a cool witness if instead of throwing a big bash for your birthday, you would throw a big bash for your baptismal birthday. Because spiritually speaking, well, not even spiritually speaking, just in general, it's a far more significant day to you than even the day of your birthday. Because it's a day of your new birth, water and the spirit. Um, all right, uh, the power of baptism. So it's new, I think. Yes, it is. So uh, you are, just as a disclaimer, anytime we go a little over, don't feel guilty if you need to leave it new. Um, I'm just going to finish this, this last part here at the bottom of this page. Uh, the power of baptism. How can water do such great things? Right? The thing we talked about before. Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. So um, if you don't believe what's been given to you in baptism, what happens? Is the baptism in the No. But something does happen. Yeah. Promise. You've been yeah. given a promise. You walk away. Right. I think it's hard to walk away. It is. It is. It is difficult, and it's and it's designed that way. Right. Baptism is a powerful, amazing, wonderful gift. It's the best gift you can give your children. It's the best gift you can give yourself. Well, you're not going to give it, but you know what I mean. Um, and it's not easy to shape confidence in a baptism. It can be done. It's not easy, which is good. 
to have the Holy Spirit, but you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah. And that, that is a like a perpetual thing. So it's not what you were saying before, where I fell away and I come back to the church. When you come back to the church, you're no longer rejecting the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, you've decided to stop resisting and take on the role of receiving the gift. Um, but even when you stop resisting and you receive the, the gift from God, it's his work right, that causes you to do all those things. Um, okay. Pastor, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say, I, like some churches teach like that baptism is like a the prisoning of a ship or something. Like it's not, it's more like, well, now this person came to Christ, so this is just part of showing everybody else that. Sure. Yeah, so that's why it's important that it's it's not an external symbol, yeah. right? Um, that's what like the Pentecostals would be saying it is. It's an external symbol because until you get the Holy Spirit baptism, it didn't really we don't really believe it, right? So it's just a symbolic act, right? Um, and it's not even a you wouldn't even say that it's like a public affirmation of something that already exists within you. It's not that either. This actually makes you into a new creation. Right? So the, the baptism itself does something. Um, but that's, again, it goes back to being paired with teaching. That's a package deal, right, for making disciples. To be a disciple, you're going to get baptized, and you have to be taught, right? So that's one reason why Christian Ed team here is wanting to do some learning challenges, because look around. What percentage of our members are in Bible study? We ought to be concerned about that, not because we want to just have more people down here, although maybe we do. I do. But we want them to have a secure, be more secure in their faith by instruction in God's word, because that's another means by which we receive the Holy Spirit, by which we're encouraged in our faith. That's why those things are put together, right? Now, maybe they go to another Bible study, not Sunday morning, which is this one. Uh, but it really should be more of a focus. Right? We should be more concerned with not just getting here on Sunday, but, but learning, growing. Right? Um, I was listening to somebody, uh, another pastor I was listening to uh, one of his Bible studies, and he was saying, there really isn't anywhere else in the world where it's assumed that an eighth grade education is sufficient for the rest of your life, except the church. Right? Um, and, and it really is, I've seen this in my own experience, confirmation still has magic power. When somebody's kids get old enough to do confirmation, you may have not seen them for years, and all of a sudden now, like it, yeah. it clearly wasn't that they couldn't make the commitment because now they're making a commitment not only to come to church but to bring their kids to a class once a week. And they do it because for some reason they think that that's going to be super important. Let me tell you, it's not going to be super important if you're not doing any of the other stuff. No, I can't discount the Holy Spirit. He's amazing. He can do things I can't even dream. Okay. But that doesn't involve that my plan should be based on like that stuff rather than what God is asking. Right. Um, okay. Uh, for without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism. That is a life-giving water, rich in grace, and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy city. Okay. We're out of time for today. Um, but before I dismiss the class, any last questions about baptism? Okay. Let's close the word. Dear Lord, Father, we thank you for the gift of baptism gift you've given your church as a means of your grace by which we can be assured that you have claimed us as your own not that we have committed to be faithful to you for we are that's not privilege but that you have committed to be faithful for us and you are always true to your promises be with those who were baptized and have fallen away draw them back to you help us could it be your will that you use one of us help us recognize the opportunities to bear witness to that uh, to remind them of their baptism so that they can relish in the joy of that gracious gift. 
uh, be with each of the people in this room this week as they go about their, their callings that you've placed in their life. Grant them opportunity to bear witness to you, to serve others in your name, and to love as you have first loved. Thank you.